ladies and gentlemen, welcome from the heart of Central Texas. It is 7.30 and it is time for Breaking the Chain. Tonight we have special guests, John and Martha King. By now, most of you know who I am. I'm Jeremy Walters. I'm an aviation uh, professional pilot. I'm typed in six different aircraft, master CFI, former Army aviator who flew the uh, 864 Apache Longbow, master CFI, former um, uh, commission officer, actually current commission officer and aviation content creator. And I enjoy focusing on uh, promoting, uh, promoting and inspiring others to do the right thing uh, when uh, promoting uh, everybody to do the right thing when no one's watching, teaching, mentoring, and uh, doing safe decision making. I could not do what I do without my beloved family uh, who supports me and has got my back every way and every day that I walk through this journey. It's awesome that we have our good friend Paul back tonight to join us. Paul Nadal is not only uh, funnier, better looking, got better memes, uh, he also loves to promote aviation and he also likes to promote education as well. So Paul is back tonight and he'll be also helping with the Q&A session. So tonight's guest actually needs no introduction, but I do have a story to share. Um, tonight's guest duo, um, when I was a young flight instructor candidate in my very early 20s, uh, I had no issues learning uh, aviation aeronautical knowledge, but uh, one of my greatest challenges was learning how to teach people. Uh, how to figure out what made people tick, uh, the psychological aspects of becoming an instructor, and no different than any other young instructor, um, and you know, teaching and conveying information to people. Uh, all of those challenges that we face, which we call the fundamentals of instruction. Uh, this is a skill, a skill that we have to learn and it becomes an art. And that's something that is not gained overnight. And you have to acquire this baseline of knowledge through the standard. So throughout my career, I've had amazing instructors help guide me down this path of success, two of which are tonight's guests. Uh, I credit my success on becoming a CFI to the video instruction received by these two aviation filmmaking pioneers. John and Martha King were there for me in the early 2000s when I started working on my CFI. Tonight, a little over 20 years later, it is my greatest honor to bring these two instructors from my television in my living room to break in the chain. Ladies and gentlemen, with humility and respect, I introduce to all of you John and Martha King. <laughs> well, Welcome. what a privilege to have played a role in your life, Jeremy. Thank you very, very much. And folks, in case there's any confusion about this, I'm John King. <laughs> and I'm Martha King. And it's, it's a, a privilege to be here. We, are, we share a great passion for flying, and it's gotten Martha and I in trouble. We, we went uh, bankrupt probably because we spent too much money flying when we first got started. And uh, we were in a business we didn't have a passion for. And when things got tough in that business, uh, we weren't willing to, to go the, the extra mile. When because got tough, we went flying. Yeah, we went flying. <laughs> exactly right. And, and we got bankrupt as a result of it. We said, wow, that hurt. Let's not do that anymore. Let's do something for the fun of it. And so we started teaching ground schools. And we said our, our plan was to, to do that until a serious business came along. And now it's been, um, what is it? Uh, 47 years. 47 years we're still still looking for a serious business um, uh, but we've had a we've had a great time for those last 47 years 
And, and we've had a lot of folks uh, tell us that uh, business people are greedy. And, and, and I, I'm going to defend entrepreneurs because uh, I, I have a hard time with that concept. And that really came along because of uh, Jack Welch, who was with GE, who said, uh, nothing matters but my stockholders. I don't care about the customers. I don't care about the employees. What really matters is I'm going to support the stockholders. And, and we think that's not correct and it doesn't work. And as a result, people are referring to business people as greedy. And, and it's counterintuitive, but we think that, uh, uh, that the way you get ahead in life is you seek out and take care of the needs of other people. And that surprises everybody. And as, as a result, we wrote a, a book about it. The book is called Lift. Uh, it's an amazing title, isn't it? And it's and it's how to start, run, and grow your own successful business. And and so we're going to quote a lot of this book uh, out of this book because it tells our aviation business story. And we and we we think we've died and gone to heaven because we're in a business and uh, and it's based on aviation. It still is after those. 47 years. And when Martha and I got started, we decided we we're going to be equal partners in everything we would do. And I'm still struggling to be an equal partner with Martha. And I want to make it clear right now, she's only a little bit better pilot than I am. Just a little bit better than I am. Go ahead. Yeah, I think your lady is flumping the table. Uh, oh, I, she's trying to give me a message. I, I thought it was romantic, but... Uh, uh, but but it worked out it wasn't. She thinks I'm bumping the table. Uh, so anyway, we've we've had a we've had a great time together. And uh, as I say, I've, I've all, those 47 years, I'm still struggling to be an equal pilot to Martha, or equal equal partner with Martha. Um, but we've been we've been partners in business, partners in aviation. Uh, we have identical uh, certificates and ratings, and uh, close to the same amount of hours. And it's uh, it's it's been a uh, a real joy, <clears throat> and we have we've gotten there because we've been doing something that we had a real passion for, and that is teaching aviation. And um, you know, a lot a lot of people probably would have looked, particularly some time ago, um, uh, and, and said, "Well, you know." If, Teaching ground school would be a nice thing to do one or two nights a week, but in terms of a full-time job, it's a, it's a dead-end waste of time. And the, the thing is, when you have a passion for something, it makes everything, it makes you work harder at everything and be more innovative and inventive to see how you can turn it into something that will let you do it full time and do it profitably. And um, and that's what we ended up doing. If you have a passion, you'll persist through adversity, which right. we weren't willing to do in the first business. Our first business was lubricating fleets of trucks. And you had to work at night and you're out there uh, servicing these trucks. It wasn't a lot of fun. And we didn't have a passion for it. So when things got tough, we began to wish we weren't in that business. And that's no way to be successful in a business to wish you weren't in the business. When so, we were in uh, college, we met at Indiana University. And um, after we were married and uh, had graduated, we uh, took some classes in their MBA, pro MBA program uh, from a professor who's um, specialized in uh, what he called a, a class in enterprise and entrepreneurship. And what he did is he had about <clears throat> 12 students, I think. Like and we met at his house uh, once a week in the evenings, and he would have uh, business leaders come in and talk to us, most of them people who had started their own businesses. Some were people who were running big businesses, uh, Martin Marietta and, and companies like that. Uh, this was in 65, 66, and, um, and have them talk to us about why they thought they were successful and what they thought the issues were about um, uh, that people who wanted to be in business need to, needed to watch out for. And it, it was fascinating because <clears throat> every one of them was passionate about what they'd been doing. And every one of them laid out for us the hard and fast rules of success in business. And the amazing thing about them was none of their rules, sets of rules were the same. 
everyone had hard and fast rules, but everyone's rules were different. And what we came away from, from that in part was there were some few broad concepts that they all shared, but by and large, um, you had to fit the style of your business and the steps for your success to your own personality and what you knew your own capabilities were going to be. But we developed some, um, uh, some acronyms, uh, some mnemonics that we use to talk. Uh, we've talked to a number of uh, high school and uh, college classes about entrepreneurship and we, we developed some mnemonics, <laughs> you know, in aviation, we've always got to have lots of them and uh, uh, to help people remember the things, the takeaways we had that we thought were particularly important. So tonight we're going to give you our hard and fast rules for success. And, and, uh, and if you're, we're thinking that we'd do a lot of aviation talk tonight. We're going to do aviation business talk tonight, and uh, I hope you get something from it. Uh, I'd like for you to get out a pencil and paper, and I'd like for you to write these words down. The first word is play, P-L-A-Y, and the next word is Scrabble, and then with TNT. So we're going to suggest that to get ahead, you play Scrabble with TNT. Now, we've already said that you seek out and take care of other people's needs, and the and the three, there are three groups of people you need to take care of. One is your customers, because if you're not taking care of their needs, why would they buy from you? The second group you need to take care of is the people who devote their lives working with you. They give you their most precious thing, and that's the time in their lives. And they share that with you. And why would they do that if you weren't seeking out and taking care of their needs? And the third one is, uh, is uh, uh, your, your, your vendors. Um, why would they sell to you if you weren't taking care of their needs? And we've really had that pay off. In the last, last um, few years, paper has gotten very expensive. We do, a we do about 2 million catalogs a year, and we couldn't find paper and couldn't find ink. And our catalog printer came to us and said, well, we're running, we're having a real hard time getting paper, but let us assure you that we're going to make sure you get paper because you treat us well. And, and all of a sudden, we were very thankful that we've been treating our vendor well. So taking care of vendors counterintuitively is very important. So let's go back to play Scrabble with TNT. Uh, we're suggesting that's how you get ahead. The first word play starts out with passion. If you have a passion uh, for what you're doing, uh, you'll you'll work harder, you'll work longer, you'll you'll uh, work your way through adversity. So if you want to be successful, have a passion for it because you're gonna you're gonna last longer. And we've had a passion uh, for uh, for a flying, and and that's helped us stay through this for 47 years. We we you know we're ground instructors and we're eating regularly. And and people have said, John, how is it you're still eating regularly after 47 years as ground instructors? And what, there are two, two, two basic things. Number one, um, we, we have um, had feedback, gotten solicited and followed the feedback from our customers. Whenever someone takes a course, we ask them uh, what they like, what they didn't like, and we listen to it very, very seriously and, and follow that feedback. And that's why taking care of your customers matters because they're going to help you with your business. They want you to succeed. And uh, we got started as really young kids in this business, and everybody was trying to help us succeed. And uh, what we felt we had to be in business for ourselves because we decided we we're going to be equal partners in everything we would do. And we thought it was unlikely that if we got hired by General Motors, they would have us be equal partners. And uh, so we felt we had to be in our own business, and we have been for all those 47 years. And we've been in this business for 47 years. We've been in our own business for a little bit more than that because we went bankrupt the first time. So the play says, have a passion for it and you'll persist through difficulty and it'll work for you. The L is uh, lots of interest. You're just interested in everything. So if you have lots of interest, you'll learn a lot of things and, and, and you want to be a learner. And then the A is, um, uh, I got that messed up, didn't I? Uh, no, the, the uh, L is uh, um, lots of interest, and the A is always learning. Always learning, yeah. I, I, I messed up, I mixed, put them together. So the A is always learning. The L is lots of interest. A is always learning. And Y is yet again, because if you make a habit of it, you'll, you'll do all of these things, and it'll help you. So go ahead. That's one of the things that we observed when these entrepreneurs would come and talk to us in the evenings is that 
as much as they knew, as expert as they were with uh, in their particular industry, community, subject area, they still always wanted uh, to be learning. They talked all the time about learning, but not only in their own primary subject area, but in lots of other things, random areas of interest that, um, that struck them as interesting. And at some point they thought, well, maybe uh, we'll be able to do something with this. Uh, and sometimes they could, and sometimes it was something else that they were able to. They read widely about business things. They were always reading and always learning. Um, so uh, play Scrabble. Now go ahead and tell, explain what play Scrabble means. Well, we like, we like to think about the skills that people acquire in business as uh, Scrabble letters and playing the late game of Scrabble. Now, for the- we, we think everything that you know more about than other people do is a Scrabble letter for you. It's, it's a resource and we call those resources Scrabble letters. Right. In the board game of Scrabble, as those who have played it will remember, you have a set number of tiles that you pull out of a pile and you don't know what you're pulling until you get it out and you have a chance to turn the tile up and, uh, and look and see what you have. <clears throat> and then try and combine the, the limited number of tiles because you can only have seven at a time uh, into words. And, and you're trusting to the luck of the draw as you pull them out of the big pile on the table to give you uh, letters that you'll be able to combine to make valuable words. And of course, the more valuable the words you can make, the higher your score and the more likely you are to win. That's the board game of Scrabble. But the, the really neat thing about <clears throat> Scrabble applied to life is that you have a choice in what Scrabble letters you get what Scrabble letters you pull to yourself. The Scrabble letters you pull to yourself can be whatever you have a passion about, whatever you have a deep interest in and dig into and develop a skill at, that's a Scrabble letter. And you get to choose uh, yeah, which okay. one in life, which ones you're going to have and how many you're gonna have. You're not limited to seven Scrabble letters. You can just keep <laughs> Tallying them up, 7, 10, 15, 20, however many Scrabble letters you want. And the more Scrabble letters you have, the more interesting ways you can find out to combine them and create um, business. interesting uh, businesses and Possible. or interesting new opportunities uh, in the business that you're already in. <laughs> so... We like to talk about our own story in Scrabble letters. And as John has talked about our passion for aviation, that really was our first starting Scrabble letter. We- um, But unless you can do something with that uh, passion for aviation, it, it, you can't make a living off of it. And it's very hard to make a very high value word out of one letter in the board game for Scrabble. And you can't do much of it in life with only one passion. So passion for aviation, that's a starter. But our second Scrabble letter is we learn to be good teachers and we think passionate teachers of aviation knowledge. Uh, we really enjoyed it. We got into it. We taught live two-day weekend ground school seminars for 10 years and got to know the customers who wanted that kind of education um, very, very well and had a lot of friends. We would go back to cities on a regular circuit and uh, meet the same people often many times, uh, have parties at their homes in the evening and they would bring in friends and uh, to the classes. So the whole idea of these Scrabble letters is you combine mm -hmm. them and you make something valuable out of it. So we had a passion for flying and we learned to teach flying and we combined them and we, we had a way to make a living. At that time, what we had <clears throat> is we owned a good job. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't a business as you would think of a business. It was John and me going out and teaching two day ground schools, having a great time doing it. But 
a good a, a good job, a really good job as far as we were concerned, but a good job. So the next thing we did is we did a lot of studying about direct marketing. We went to seminars, uh, we read a lot of books, uh, <clears throat> we, we talked to people uh, who were direct marketers and what we learned to do was very effective direct marketing to pull people to our two-day ground school classes. So we would be having classes in places like Billings, Montana, and through our direct marketing, uh, marketing efforts, uh, we could pull in 100, 150 people for a weekend for the two-day ground schools. And so when we started, uh, we could go around uh, airports and maybe scrounge up five pilots for, for a weekend. And so when we learned to uh, mail a mailer out to all the pilots in about a 300 mile radius, we're, we're teaching 100, 150 uh, pilots in a weekend. So it, it became a really business, it became a good business. The combination uh, of the direct marketing skills with our uh, passion for aviation and our passion for teaching now gave us an actual business. So we, th those are our three Scrabble letters at that time. And we went for about 10 years that way with those three Scrabble, Scrabble letters. Right. And then um, video came along, home video came along and we ended up putting our two day weekend ground schools onto <clears throat> uh, VHS tape. There will be, some number of people out there who Excuse what me. VHS is. And by putting it onto VHS tape, we were we now had a product that we could ship out to people and we didn't have to show up every weekend in person. So we, we started teaching, a, uh, we started putting the video uh, in our classrooms and using them in our classrooms. So that relieved the fatigue factor for us. And someone said, you know, you should put your courses on, on, on video and sell them on video. And I said, well, that just goes to show you don't know one thing about our business. It won't work on video. And the guy says, well, I don't know how you can say that if you haven't tried it. So guy was very persistent with us, telling us how stupid we are. And uh, so eventually we, we, we put it on video and it did work on video. And, and because we had the ability to do direct marketing, we could now market um, the, the, those video courses to, to flight instructors all around the entire United States. And so we did that. And so we now had four good Scrabble letters. The first one was, of course, uh, passion for aviation. Second was teaching. Uh, and, and the third was direct marketing. And the fourth was video. And now we had a product we could ship out and we could teach people in their living rooms. So we'd, but John and Martha would hold ground school courses in their living rooms for them. And it became a terrific, terrific uh, big good deal for the customers and a good deal for us. And we wound up uh, within a few years of teaching half the pilots in the country. It was just, and we didn't see that coming. It's just that we got the right Scrabble letters and, and we had the tools to make it work and tools so that we wound up teaching half the pilots in the country. And we enjoyed it and had a great time. Um, and I, I said, well, the first thing we did, oh, I gave, I gave our rules for success. One was that we answered the feedback from customers. Number two, we kept up with technology. So keeping up with technology is, as uh, Paul will know, uh, helps you in your business and it, and it did for us. And the process of keeping up with technology, we went from VHS tapes to, um, uh, we developed the technology to deliver uh, the courses on computer and we started selling it on CD-ROMs and then on DVDs. And then we made a big leap and uh, put our programs on the internet. And what that meant was <clears throat> that customers and learners got much easier access to our courses. They didn't have to wait for uh, uh, a week or something two to be days delivered or, to or something we had to, to be delivered. We had to install the DVDs and CDs on their computers. Right. And, that was difficult because everybody had different different setups on their computers different operating and, and, systems. and it was frustrating for the customer. So when we put it online, it just made it go so much easier for both us and them. And 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 now we ship uh, ship uh, um, electrons. Oh, right. Um, so it's right. a lot, lot lighter to ship. Um, so well, that works really well for us. The most recent um, Scrabble letter is the ability to pull those courses 
off of the internet online and let people download them to their mobile devices, download them to their phones, to their uh, iPads, whatever mobile device they're using and take them with them to the beach or on an airliner or, or wherever they wanna go. So now the internet made it easier uh, to deliver the courses uh, without a lot of um, IT issues. And this made it easier for them to take it and study it anywhere. Yeah. So uh, uh, having lots of interests and always learning helped us accumulate these Scrabble letters. And so that's why we say have a passion, lots of interest and always learning. Then you get these Scrabble letters and you can do something with them. And we didn't know where this was gonna go, but boy, when we learned to, to market by direct marketing, it, it went national and and uh, it, it, we, we wound up eating regularly as a result of it. And I um, suppose <laughs> the final thing at this point that has really helped out, there's always another one just down the road, but uh, the final Scrabble letter at this point is, uh, a, a lot of study and passion about internet marketing. And we use a lot of search engine optimization. We use a lot of uh, pay-per-click. So we're using both paid and um, organic uh, advertising. And it's um, uh, really expanded our reach and our ability to talk to people who are just getting interested in aviation and are online searching, but they haven't yet gone to a flight school or, or signed up to be a member of AOPA or joined any of the EAA or, or any other association. So it's expanded our marketing reach. Mm -hmm. So I think you can see by looking at that, how each of those played off of the other earlier Scrabble letters that we had, but it all started basically with our passion for aviation and our ability for teaching. And I, I think it's enabled us, I saw a chat thing go by where somebody said, um, breaking the chain of broke. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's true. Much. Because yeah. as, we, as we say in our book, broken, not broken, we like not broken awful lot better. We do. So um, uh, having, the, the, as you can see how the play ties together with these Scrabble letters, play gets you interests and in always learning, gets you Scrabble letters. The Scrabble letters all come together. You don't know where they're going to go. But when you have them, you can rearrange them and put them together and make something out of them. And that's that's what we've been fortunate to do. Uh, and our our the 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 design of our business has changed as as technology has changed. So we have a a lot different Scrabble letters than we used to have because of technology. Uh, now that, that I had suggested earlier, you write down play Scrabble and then with TNT. So let's talk about TNT. And those TNT is three words. It's trust because to get anything done through other people, they have to trust you. So you've got to be trustworthy and. One of the things we do is we work hard at being trustworthy to, to uh, our uh, customers, to, to our people who work with us and to our vendors. And, and, and so we try to do good things for them and try and be trustworthy. When, when we hire someone, uh, just as soon as we hire them, we go to see that employee. Martha and I go show up and talk to them both personally. And we say to them, we wanna explain our obligations to you. And our obligation is to give you, the employee, meaningful and rewarding work. And not, not just meaningful to us, it's got to be meaningful and rewarding to you. You've got to really be into the work, and we want to try and set it up so you are into it, so it's rewarding to you, in an atmosphere of civility and respect. So anytime uh, while you're at King Schools, if you feel that you're not getting meaningful and reward, rewarding work in an atmosphere of civility and respect, we want you to come to us. And we're going to see that you do get meaningful and rewarding work in an atmosphere of civility and respect. And so that's why people trust you. If you have their interests at heart and you're working for them, you trust someone who respects you. You trust someone who has your interest at heart. You trust someone who's predictable and you trust someone that plays by fair rules. So we try to do all of those things. We try to be trustworthy. So the first T is trustworthy. Uh, and we're talking about how, they, and, the, and TNT allows you to sell what you've developed with your Scrabble letters. So the, the, the N is need. 
you, you, you have to be aware and seek out and take care of other people's needs. And it, the, one of the rules when you're trying to take care of other people's needs is everybody's going through life thinking with them. That's W-I-C, W-I-F-M. And it's what's in it for me. That's what we're thinking. That's what you're thinking when you're sitting here listening to this. Why am I listening to this? What's in it for me? And so you, we, we, we try and think of other people's weapons. Whenever we're with somebody or, or have an inter, a relationship with someone, we're trying to think about what's the weapon for them and are we meeting that? So you, you want to seek out and take care of other people's needs. And so you, you got to be trustworthy and you got to be taking care of their needs. And a final T, this, with, this is going to be a little hokey. You triumph with a solution to other people's needs. So the last T is triumph with a solution to other people's needs. And we make this stuff up to help people remember stuff. So we do this all the time. That's what play and TNT are all about is making things up so you'll remember. It. And so when you get done tonight, you should be able to repeat this. Play Scrabble with TNT. And you should be able to, you'll have our talk memorized. Um, and most of our book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's, that's what hey. the book is all about. It, is, hey, uh, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, John and Martha. There were some questions in there, and I know before uh, you had said we can go ahead and ask the questions as we kind of yeah. get through here, just to make yeah. sure they get addressed. Uh, okay. So first off, I'm really glad that you addressed the TNT. I knew it was going to be explosive one way or another, and I was like, <laughs> I got to see what that is. It's dynamite, so, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's dynamite. You did not. Yeah, you did not disappoint on that one. There, there's some really good questions that come across, right? And one of the things that that I think a lot of the pilots uh, kind of glean that we try to do on breaking the chain is try to bring safety, security uh, into aviation, right? Uh, and kind of a way to do it. And a lot of times, yeah, I, I think CFI, CFIIs, when they're working, trying to get onto airlines or whatever, they don't understand that they're actually doing a business, right? That, that's what they're doing. They have a customer that's sitting in the cockpit with them that they're trying to get this information over to. So it's fascinating to watch you guys adapt and overcome, especially with technology, right? That's, that's not an easy task to do. Uh, right. Kind of as you go through there. But one of the questions that came up was about how many students do you think, it, probably an estimate, that over the years have actually taken your courses? Do you guys have any idea? I, I hate to say this because it sounds like we're bragging. Uh, there's only 600,000 pilots in the United States. We think we've taught well over a million people. We've taught pilots all over the world. Uh, um, we, we had a relationship with a Microsoft Flight Simulator. And one time, about, I think, 2000, Microsoft Flight Simulator came to us and said, you know, we're, we're having a lot of people that get Microsoft Flight Simulator, go with it for a while, crash, and just fold it up, put it in a box, and put it on a shelf, and they don't get into it again and because they crashed the aircraft. And, uh, and Microsoft came to us and do, says, do you think you could make a video that would make people stay with the program? And we said, well, yes, we think we can. And so we did a video and I'm sitting there uh, being a, a male uh, kid playing with the, uh, with the program and Martha's standing over my shoulder and, and I'm doing things wrong. And she says, well, John, if you'd read the uh, book before you got started on this, <laughs> You could do that. You could solve this problem. You do really a lot better. Direction, right? <laughs> she didn't say effing, but uh, but but yeah. so it was, it was me making mistakes with the program, and Martha standing over saying, "Well, you should have read the book," and he, and it, it, it was a hit, and it, and uh, it was effective, and and w it was translated into seven different languages, and 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 this whole thing was designed to be funny. And at one point, uh, I fly in between the. Uh, 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 close to the Empire State Building, and uh, and Martha says, "John, you almost hit the Empire State Building." And the program ends, and I say, "Yeah," and it was cool too. Um, so <laughs> it, it was funny, and it was me being uh, the guy, and Martha being the the person trying to keep me out of trouble. And uh, and that's where our life goes, also. And so it was funny, and uh, the thing that was really funny about it, it was it was funny in French. It was funny in English. It was funny in Italian. And I think it was really funny is it wasn't funny in German. Um, it was just too harsh in German. Uh, but uh, so we go we go to uh, Russia and people recognize us. We go to China. People recognize us. And that's because of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, so but if you take the people that we've directly taught, they're all over the world. It's it's over a million. And as I say, it sounds like bragging. We don't we don't bring that up on our own. It just sounds like bragging. But of course, no, no. I, it, I, I'm sorry, Martha, go ahead, go ahead. We've been doing this for 47 years and we know families where we've taught three generations 
uh, pilots in that family. So people start and they quit, and that's why we get so many people. And it, but it erodes trust if you brag. And so we try not to to brag, not to be nice people, but just to be trustworthy. Because uh, if you if you're bragging all the time, people don't believe what you say. So we try not to yeah. brag. No, I was saying, and it was totally a legitimate question, right? One of the one of the viewers had actually uh, had had asked that question, and, and quite honestly, I, you know, it's it's a it's a great question uh, to have. Um, another question, and then I'll let Jeremy uh, throw one out there if he has one as well, because normally we alternate them out. But this is a second question uh, about how many flight hours do you guys have? And I know flight hours are not everything, right? I mean, you know, a well, lot of people if they you, if you can't hold a heading, you get a lot of flight time. So. We, uh, <laughs> We each have about 13,000 hours. Yeah. Okay. And again, we're trying not to brag here. <laughs> if you can't make no, a no, joke. No, 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 yeah, I know. yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. It's yeah. not very gotcha. many hours if you're a full-time professional pilot. If you're flying um, in charter, regular charter, if you are uh, flying for the airlines, um, they get a lot more flight time than that. So I think the problem with it is, is uh, you kind of spoil this, right? So we watched the CD about five times. So you actually get five hours for the one hour that you're actually flying <laughs> is what we think, right? So that's what happens with it. Sorry. Anyway, Jeremy, go ahead. It's all you on the next question. Here. Uh, you got any more questions? No, I mean, so I've got one for you. So, you know, you uh, guys have got pretty much every rating um, that you could possibly have. So, and I've got a handful wait, wait. of them as well. Uh -huh. We started off, uh, and uh, there was a time when we had every category in class. Then military people who had been flying the Osprey came back with powered lift, and they put the FA when they got out of the military put powered lift on their civilian certificates. So we don't have powered lift. You, it's you can't get it as a civilian right now. And so uh, we so we had it, we were the first couple ever to have every category in class. Well, you could, you could qualify that and say, we still have every category and class available to a civilian pilot. You could say that, yeah. That's a longer thing yes. to say. And, and a lot of people are confused about whatever category and class is. So assume, assume you have an airplane, uh, you'll, you'll have um, uh, airplane, single engine land, or single engine C. And those, th those are- multi-engine land and multi-engine and, and C. And so um, uh, the, the category is airplane. The class is um, single engine land or multi engine land or, or single or engine C and multi engine C. Those are all count. And then you'll have type ratings that Jeremy said he has what, six type ratings? I do. What are they? So I've got a Hawker. I've got an Embraer 175 190. So that's really two, one. So I, you can say five or six. And then uh -huh. I've got a King Air 300 type rating. I've got mm -hmm. a Challenger 300 type rating. And uh -huh. I got a, it, uh, the Embraer 505 or the Phenom 300 type rating. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, kind of like the, you know, the Osprey with a power lift, the Apache helicopter would be a type rating, but there's no civilian equivalent. So there isn't a right. type rating. So that would be right. seven. But really, the Apache would, would have been my first type rating. So, you know, six or seven, to, to, mm -hmm. depending on how you, mm -hmm. you swing the bat. But, you know, this is really, really what... I get asked a lot, and what I would like to ask you guys is, what is your favorite category in class, and which was your hardest? Um, well, the hardest, uh, the hardest, I would say, it remains the Falcon 10. Would you say that? Um, I, I oddly enough, the airship that we learned to yeah, fly added true. a very that's close true. second. No, not, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say the airship is the hardest thing we flew. Um, and, and the reason that the airship was the hardest is if you're flying an airplane or if you're flying a helicopter, particularly uh, something like the Apache that uh, Jeremy flew, it does what you ask it to do. In the airship, it takes skill, but but if you it, uh, on a helicopter, it right. takes skill. Yeah, it takes a lot of skill. It's hard to fly, but it does what you ask it to do. Right. In the airship. <clears throat> You would ask it to do something and the controls are poor enough that the airship would effectively sit there for some number of seconds and think about what you ask it to do and usually do it, but sometimes do the opposite just because of the way the wind currents and, and thermals and so on were behaving. And the airship, 
had a lot of a lot of mass, a lot of momentum. I, I mean, this is kind of well, something call it a trip, hard, you know. hard to get your brain around when you're talking lighter than air. But there is a lot of mass and momentum to it, and it's not real easy to stop. And you have to you have to do a lot of thinking ahead about uh, how you're going to position it, where you're going to have the crew, the uh, airship that we uh, got our airship rating in was a Skyship 600, and it had a ground crew of 13, yeah. uh, in addition to two pilots. Two were required, pilots were required on this because of the, the controls were very physical. It was all cable, and it was a long cable run to a really big a rudder and elevator on the back of the blimp. And it took a lot of muscle. And sometimes it took two of you hauling on it at the same time, or one of you on that and someone else and the other pilot working the air valves. And um, so 13 crew members and a lot of work was spent on training the pilots to be careful to not hurt the ground crew because you could very easily drag the ground crew or literally run them down because you couldn't get the blimp stopped. You thought you could, but you misjudged your momentum. And particularly on a takeoff um, or a landing, if, if you had to abort and go around, um, it, it's very risky for the ground crew because if they hang on and their feet leave the ground, the airship can go up pretty fast to the point where if they let go, they're gonna be dead. And you try and get back around to land before they just they can't up. hang on any longer. And that's almost impossible. Uh, <clears throat> it never happened with, with our crew and historically with that crew it never had, but it has happened in airship operations, which is a real tragedy. And there have been people, um, you're op not operating on the runway, you're operating in a big open field out to the side of the runway or an open field that they've gotten permission to use. It's, it's, it's obviously, it's not paved. It's, um, it's got rabbit holes, it's got uh, ground squirrel holes in it. And if you're making the ground crew run in order to, catch you and, and keep the airship under control, uh, there's a good possibility they could step into a hole and break an ankle and so on. When you get good enough that you don't do that to them anymore, you owe them a case of beer. <laughs> You've taken care of your ground crew. You've taken care of them. That's what yeah, it's that, called, right? Right, exactly. You're taking, out, you're taking care of the needs of your ground crew. The, um, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to tell a little bit more of a complicated story because I remember this when Martha became a captain. Um, she's sitting in the captain's seat, and as you're getting ready to go, uh, you have the crew member, you have the ground crew chief in front of you, and the ground crew chief is c communicating with the captain by hand signals. And, uh, and one of the things you want to tell the, the ground crew chief is where do you want the ballast? And uh, ballast how bags. much ballast do you want and where do you want it? The ba ballast was bags of lead shot that you could put in lockers either under the pilot seats or in lockers in basically the middle of the gondola uh, for balance purposes. And you had to, as John says, you had to decide how many bags and where you wanted them located. The way you determine much of this is the ground crew lifts the blimp up to about a foot above the ground and let's go. And it's called a way off. And you and everybody watches very carefully. What does it do? Does it want to keep going up or does it does it go nose down? Does it go tail down? How does it behave? And this tells the, just sit there. And, and this tells the captain who's sitting in his seat with all of these ground crew members standing around how they how they want to uh, put the ballast and how it's going to behave and 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 and, and you, you have to decide uh, 
when do I want this? If, if it's not going to go up or down, they call it EQ for equilibrium, and it's going to stay there. Uh, or it can be uh, can go, want to climb or want to descend. And, and you have to decide when is it most important to be at equilibrium? Because if you're going to be shooting uh, uh, over the U.S. Tennis Open or the Super Bowl, uh, and you're carrying a cameraman um, for, for ABC, for instance, um, so you, you have to decide, do I want to be at equilibrium when I'm shooting the event or do I want to be at equilibrium when I'm coming in landing? If, because if you're not at equilibrium, you're spending a lot of uh, airspeed and power trying to control so it doesn't climb or doesn't, it does what you want it to do. Uh, so it, it, the, the captain is sitting there thinking, well, how much fuel do I have now? How much fuel will I have when I want to be at EQ? And and how do I compensate for that? And and then one of the things you have in a blimp is what they call superheat. And that is if you, uh, in a hot air balloon, because the balloon is hotter than the ambient air, it wants to climb. Well, if the sun is shining down on the envelope of the, of the uh, 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 airship, it, it has superheat and it wants to climb just because the helium is hotter than ambient. Uh, so how much superheat do I have now? How much superheat will I have later? Uh, how much weather effect? Is there dew or uh, rain on the on the envelope? How much does that weigh? And what's the effect of that? And then what's my fuel now? What's my fuel going to be later? And the captain is sitting there with all these crew members standing around and, and the crew chief looking you in the eye and they want an answer about what do you want to do with the ballast? And the captain has to decide that on the spot. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, tough, it's a tough decision. You're under pressure and, and, and everybody Everybody's wanting to go. You got you got a, a, a ship full of passengers, and and you got uh, ABC's cameraman there, and and everybody's ready to get with the program. So you have to figure that out. And there's a lot of pressure on you in that circumstance as, as the captain of the airship. And so I, I enjoyed watching Martha. What at one point. Uh, the crew chief and she are looking at each other in the eye, and she can't remember what they're going to do next, and neither can the, neither can the crew chief. It, it was a trainee crew chief, and I was obviously a trainee pilot, right, right. and we were staring at each other, and neither one of us could remember whose turn it was to signal <laughs> something or or ask a question. Or so that's why the blunt is the hardest of all the aircraft right. to fly. We we, uh, we used to have people. Um, well, one of the, with a blimp, I learned an expression. I used to say, there is no such thing as an emergency takeoff. And there is a maneuver in a blimp called an emergency takeoff. Because if you're on the ground and a blimp is, the crew has lost control of it, and it's going somewhere you don't want it to go. Well, the only way you can get control of that blimp is get air over the flight controls. And so uh, you do an emergency takeoff. You just add power and get some air over it, and then you have control over it. So... If you're about to lose control of it due to the fact that the crew's uh, not able to keep it in control, then you do an emergency takeoff. So now I lost my I lost my expression that there's no such thing as emergency takeoff. And so I still use that in an airplane, but uh, but it's not true. In the there is, there is so I could tell you. So I could tell you, we normally have people from ForeFlight that are employees that are on these calls. So they're on these uh, webinars, right? And I see them now sitting there doing this. Is that a shot bag, John? Is that what that is? Because they're going to try to get that into ForeFlight, right? So they can do the weights and balances on it. Yeah. Well, I tell you um, what, it's, hey, it's fun to fly. It takes you, we, we, uh, we flew over the U.S. Tennis Open, the, the Super Bowl, uh, the Kentucky Derby. Uh, we got to go a lot of places. Uh, that were a big deal on, on national TV. And the, uh, 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 what, what's John Madden and what's the other guy? Paul, who are the, who are the uh, uh, oh, now football announcers? Um, John Madden, and, and they, they spent their time talking about John and Martha flying the blimp. Because it was very unusual. I mean, we were the only husband and wife uh, airship crew. Yeah. And um, airship pilots, yeah. Pilot it was fun. Too. It was fun. We enjoyed it. We got we got to go a lot of places. We we fly over downtown New York and lots of places. That's awesome. Yeah. So it was, it was how fun. did how did you guys? This is something that if you don't feel comfortable with, it totally understand. Somebody had asked, "How did you guys meet? Did you meet through aviation or was it before? Yeah. How did you guys I, meet?" I each was other? rejected uh, as a date by Martha's sister. <laughs> I dated Martha's sister first. She rejected me, and she did it very early in our dating by saying you'd really like my sister and the, the, I, I, I'd, consider, I'd consider that a rejection but she's it's worked out i have really liked her sister so uh, Good. so for 57 years we're, we're getting along as partners we met uh at indiana university that's where my sister and i and john were all going to school in bloomington uh, down south of indianapolis and um 
Um, when you're when, when you're about to join a fraternity, they have what they call rush, and 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 they uh, have you come, and they have a party for you, and and they supply dates and so on. And uh, Martha's sister was was my date for that rush party, um, and so uh, we we kept dating after after uh, after that. John's gotcha. had owned an airplane uh, when John was young. And John had gotten to fly with his father in it and had a family friend <clears throat> who took him up a lot in a pacer. So John was hooked on aviation uh, well before we met. He had soloed um, when you were 16, yeah, right, right. Um, in high school and then quit flying uh, because he figured that he needed to save money to go to uh, college and you were paying the awful rate of how much? $8 John? an hour, including the instructor. Uh, it was outrageous. Horrible. And Horrible I, and I, rates. Horrible. I, didn't, I didn't feel I could continue that because I needed to go to college. So I quit flying because of that. Uh, Martha's, yeah. Martha's father was in the Air Force and, and she lived at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So we would, we would go into Dayton and go see Martha. And yeah. she, she would get to ride in the backseat of a pacer. So, there you go. We, uh, we got married. Um, we uh, got into this first business, the oil changes and lubrications for truck fleets. We sold our operation in Indianapolis with the intention of franchising it, which we did and, um, and which did not turn out to be uh, successful. We eventually went bankrupt in it. But after we sold the operation, John said, we've got time, we've got money. Before we get started franchising, let's go learn to fly. So we bought a Cherokee 140 and learned to fly in Indianapolis. And um, two days after we got our private pilot certificates, we took off in the Cherokee 140 for a trip to Florida and over to the Bahamas. And this was uh, right around Christmas time. And on our way back from that trip, as we headed north and got to Southern Tennessee, there was all of a sudden all this white stuff on the ground. And John and I looked at each other and we said, we always wanted to go to California. Let's go to California. And right on the spot, we turned on the left, uh, turned left and went out to California and flew up and down the California coast looking for a place that we thought we'd like to live. And we ended up in San Diego. So mm -hmm. as a private pilot's license within your first month, you had more hours than oh, a lot of CFIs that yeah, flying yeah. on that whole thing. And as true fanatics, uh, when we moved from Indianapolis to uh, San Diego, we paid someone to drive our car while we flew the airplane out. So we, we, we were really hooked. We went... Um, uh, bought a very soon afterwards bought a Comanche because the Cherokee Cherokee wasn't fast enough for us, and uh, and the uh, that twin Comanche and we had with the Comanche we went down to Acapulco right. and up to Barrow in the same few Barrow, months. Alaska. Yeah. So that was nice. the years when they were building the pipeline, and we were up at Dead Horse when they had huge stacks of pipe and all the pipeline building going on and. Uh, unloading for the pipeline in uh, Valdez, Alaska. And um, it, that was a fun time. Now you you can say that what we were doing is accumulating Scrabble letters because uh, yeah. we, got, we got the experience in flying that let us teach flying. So we were just, we were just getting Scrabble letters. That's, so sure, we, absolutely. We were having a fantastically fun time doing it as far as we were concerned. And that was, our, our primary focus on, on why we were doing it. And uh, sometimes you end up with Scrabble letters just because, wow, uh, you did something you enjoyed so much. And, and, and I mean, the cross country flying we did in those first uh, five to 10 years uh, just gave us an enormous background when we got into doing the two day ground schools, a lot of flying, uh, as we would go back and forth to Alaska, no radar, doing position reports, working with controllers in Canada, as you go from uh, Washington State up to Alaska. And um, it gave us the ability to 
to really talk knowledgeably about uh, what we were teaching. So when you have a passion for something, getting Scrabble letters is fun. And, and yeah. that's, to me, that's the secret of life. Just enjoy it with, with passion, with zest, and uh, you're gonna be an interesting person. You're gonna learn a lot and you'll be able to put Scrabble letters together and do things for people. And you're gonna be able to take care of the needs of other people that way. Outstanding. You know, one, one more question. What, uh, and, and, and individually or together or whatever, what is your favorite airplane that you've flown? And what is your least favorite airplane that you've flown and kind of why? Well, um, uh, we, we like helicopters a lot. If you're going to fly VFR, looking out the window, and shooting these flowers, we were flying in, in California near Paso Robles, and this is south of Paso Robles. We saw these flowers. I was flying the helicopter. We in took R22. it in R-22. We took it down and hovered over these flowers, and Martha took these pictures. So uh, uh, helicopters are a great way to see the countryside. Uh, just the, fabulous. The Falcon uh, 10 that we uh, own and fly now, um, it's fantastic for us because uh, it's a real traveling machine. Uh, it, it's Mach 0.87 limited, and it will do that if the uh, if it's uh, standard temperature and you're at a reasonable altitude, 35 to 38 uh, thousand feet, and um, it, it's just a fabulous way to get across the country. It, it's a it's a fast airplane. It got lots of performance. If if you're uh, circling and the weather gets bad, uh, it'll get out of dodge. Uh, you could just put the power in and it's going up at 4,000 feet a minute. So it's a great airplane. It's a lot of, it's a fun airplane. We so really what's like your it. least favorite? Oh boy. Um, well, you didn't almost like a blimp. It almost sounded like yeah. a blimp from what it sounded yeah. like earlier. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's the hardest to fly. It's the hardest to fly. Yeah. There's so much history and um, uh, romanticism, if you will, uh, attached to a blimp that it's, um, um, it, it, we're very, very fond of it, even though we recognize a great deal of difficulty. I don't, I don't think we have, uh, we, we don't think in terms of, I don't like this airplane. Sure. We just don't, we don't think that way. So we don't have a least favorite airplane. Talk to me about my favorite uh, float planes. Oh, we love, we love float planes, yeah. And do you have any beaver time and any adventures in Alaska or Canada or anything of that nature? Lots of adventures in Alaska. We had a friend who had a 185 who just encouraged us to fly his airplane. And we would fly him and uh, people to places in there. We'd fly from Fairbanks down to Kenai and, and, and did that all the time. On boats, yeah. And we'd land, land on the Kenai River. And uh, one, of the, this, th one of the problems of landing in the Kenai River, or any river for that matter, is a lot of the boaters are, are drunk at the time. And they think, it's, uh, <laughs> they think it's great sport to just get right in front of the airplane when you're landing. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that makes it interesting. Yeah, it just make, makes it complicated. That never happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, float plane flying is, is one of the fun things. I, take, I agree. Take your places you can't go. I think when someone asks me my, what my favorite flying is, I usually say yes. <laughs> that's, that's a good yeah, answer. I do that's like helicopter answer. flying. Yeah. And as I say, you know, we, we share all of this stuff equally. Martha's Martha's a seaplane pilot and a helicopter pilot. We, uh, I, I started I started to start bragging, and I'm not going to start bragging. We're both gyroplane uh, pilots, which yeah. there's uh, very minimal use for, yeah. Yeah. but it was fun. Yeah, we have them. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop. I started to go down to, uh, uh, talking about the certificates and ratings we had, and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stop. I want to be, I still want to be trustworthy. Are, um, are we going to take a ride to space eventually now that there's civilian uh, uh, space uh, travel available? Um, yeah, if, if it were, I, mean, it's a, I would think it's a life changing event. I would love to go to space. Um, we, it, nobody's offered us a space ride recently, but uh, I would love to do that. <laughs> I heard the tickets are a little expensive. <laughs> Imagine. There's more than $8. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. A little, little over eight dollars, I think. Yeah. 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 Think so, exactly. Yeah. Well, we got any more questions? Well, huh? uh, well, yes. we've reached our, uh, we've expired our time limit with you guys tonight. Unless you want to stay a little longer, 
But well, uh, I'm going to say, folks, thank you for staying with us, and I'd like for you to play Scrabble with TNT. Outstanding. Well, um, John and Martha, it's been an absolute blast having you as guests this evening. Um, I cannot thank you for what uh, you have done for me as a professional, uh, for my development as a pilot uh, growing up in the um, in the aviation community, uh, what you continue to do, uh, what you continue to do for me and what you do for others. Um, and uh, I, I really appreciate you contributing your time, your energy, um, and sharing the stories both before and during tonight. And well, so Jeremy, I love the way you talk. Thank you very much. And I wanna, say, I wanna make a special wish for you at this point. Uh, keep the pointy end forward, the dirty side down, and by all means, please. Bring me out of the trees. All right. All right, ladies Thank and gentlemen. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I hope you had a good night. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this will be up on YouTube in a few days. And um, I really appreciate everybody participating tonight. Fly safe, keep learning, and never give up on a dream. So long. Thank, thanks for making it available to us. All right.